land. So where it hits land is an incredibly important uh, detail. Hitting Rhode Island, which is just uh, down the road, they have 75,000 outages in Rhode Island, um, given the nature of that hit there. I was just on the phone with uh, Governor McKee up in Rhode Island saying anything we can do to work together to keep people safe. 75,000 in Rhode Island, 24,000 in uh, Connecticut at this point. Uh, that, that number is um, concerning. Most of the outages in southeast Connecticut, um, Canterbury, I'm afraid, seems to be number one, Stonington number two, Plainfield and other towns. Um, as the storm continues to move from um, southeast or northeast, northwest Connecticut, you'll see that over the next uh, 12 hours or so. We're at a, you know, 24,000, compare that to 800,000 that were the outages we had at the worst of uh, ICEA. Uh, but we're still just getting started. We'll have to track this uh, very closely going forward. 75,000 Rhode Island, 24,000 um, Connecticut, 7,000 Massachusetts, 2,600 New York. Those are the number of outages. Again, just a reminder how big a deal it is uh, where uh, the storm hits. Uh, I got to say, I was just joking a little bit with the friends in the operations center where for the last year I've been an amateur epidemiologist. Uh, over the last uh, week I've been an amateur um, meteorologist and Susan says I may need a psychologist pretty <laughs> soon. But fortunately um, I've got David Manning here. David is uh, here on loan, National Weather Service, so we have a me real meteorologist to help uh, answer your questions. It's fascinating. I mean, they have planes flying through the hurricane monitoring in real time along with the radar, along with uh, what you get with satellite delivery, tracking where the densest of the rainfalls are so we can track that in terms of where they'll stream into the rivers and what parts of the rivers are most likely, you know, to flood. You know, so uh, our team, I think, here is well organized and working this very hard. Broadly speaking, the other thing moving the eye of the storm up to westerly is it's an outside the entrance to Long Island Sound. Outside the entrance a little bit means less uh, storm surge inside Long Island Sound, less storm surge along our coast, which um, I think makes an enormous difference. A little less wind, you know that we've gone from a hurricane to tropical storm, but um, don't get complacent. Uh, as I said before, Sandy, I see uh, those were um, not hurricanes either. Because the terrain is so wet, you do have just a 40, 50 a knot gust, knocks over trees, and that's why we're watching the power outage situation so carefully. You know, with that, i got to say we've been in close contact with FEMA, have been incredibly supportive. They've got um, water resources up here and water trailers are over at our New Britain facility right now. We've had to close down several nursing uh, facilities, move people there, um, uh, residents there to more uh, safe, secure places as well. And, um, you know, with that, we're happy to take your questions. Uh, I mentioned David Manning, a National Weather Service, uh, Brenda, Regina, Marissa Gillette, I think you know Marissa, runs Pura, and very close relationship in terms of monitoring what's going on with our utilities and telecom. So there was one in Guilford, Brant uh, Guilford Old Saybrook, and Brenda, do you remember the other one? In West Haven. I'll get you that. And it was about 280-ish people altogether. And you said they've gone through the uh, To an alternative site. I'm concerned about that. I think that's the biggest risk uh, that we have right now. Uh, as you know, um, we had a lot of rain over the last week. Um, the topsoil is thin. You have a uh, rock underneath. That means the topsoil is filling up like a sponge fills with water. That water is pouring off right now. Uh, we have a lot of some potential for urban flooding, not to mention the highest tides, as I said uh, yesterday, due to the full moon. So we're water following the um, flooding possibilities very carefully and tracking that. Right now, mayors uh, working with their local emergency centers and give us the information so we can all respond accordingly. Um, 
question is about possibility that uh, there are going to be electric outages, people uh, without air conditioning, 90 degree temperatures next week. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we're getting the power back on. As I said before, we've got twice as many crews on the ground as we've ever had before. Um, really prioritizing the densest areas where you have the most outages so we can take care of people there. Uh, secondly, in terms of generators and the such, we've got standby power to back that up. That's particularly concerning in places like nursing homes where uh, they can't. And finally, we have the cooling centers. And uh, worse comes to worse, and they can't get air conditioning in places where people absolutely need it, not to mention a power just to keep your medicine and your food safe will get you to a cooling center. And people should call 211 to find out where they can charge their phones, take a shower, be in the AC. A lot of municipalities are standing those up. Yeah, I'm going to introduce David to uh, Doug. I can just tell you right now, you looked at the track of this storm. It's going right across from uh, eastern Connecticut to, uh, you know, northwest Connecticut. And that's where most of the rain will be dropping. But, David, do you want to add to that? Uh, sure. Uh, right now, our forecasters are monitoring all the information that we get from this storm. And as the ra heavy rainfall moves into the northwest part of the state, we will be watching and issue flood warnings and flash flood warnings as the situation dictates. So once we get the rainfall that actually hits the ground, we'll issue the necessary warnings. Sure, great question. So the Take Back Our Grid Act, which was uh, signed into law by the governor last fall following uh, the August tropical storm, uh, empowered uh, PURA uh, to hold the utilities accountable in ways that we have not seen before. One of those includes being able to file, um, residential customers being able to file for reimbursement of lost food and spoiled prescription medication. Um, they also are empowered to uh, receive a $25 per day uh, credit for outages that last longer than 96 hours. The 96 hours is also the same provision for the lost food uh, and spoiled medication. That clock, importantly, doesn't start ticking until uh, damage assessors can get out into the area. So basically, once this so storm has left the area and uh, damage assessors can get out there safely, uh, that's when the clock starts ticking. Sure, the damage assessors are proactively deployed by the utilities. So the number of damage assessors that both utilities have to deploy was um, pure one of the findings from our tropical storm uh, investigation mandated that they greatly accelerate the number of damage assessors uh, and that they have to get those damage assessors out into the field as soon as it's safe to do so. Uh, so once the storm moves, the, uh, moves out of the area. So Jody, I think Eversource told us that they had 600 damage assessors ready to go. I would agree wholeheartedly with that statement. I think you saw the governor endorse that approach last year as well. Uh, so the switch from the cost-based rate-making model to performance-based regulation is underway. PIRA opened that docket in June, and we're already making strides towards that. Uh, so I think I've been pretty vocal about the need for uh, the shifting um, from the uh, rate payers to the utility shareholders, excuse me, um, and you will see us uh, undertake that in earnest over the next year. I haven't seen the uh, weekend numbers yet. I'm going to get that. Uh, we, we were flattening the curve at the end of last week, but we are working very closely because we're bringing in utility folks from all over the region as far afield as Texas. You know, some places are more infected than um, Connecticut. 
So I can tell you that Deirdre Gifford is very uh, conscious about making sure that testing and vaccinations are available for all the people coming into the state to deal with uh, this hurricane. Would you like Paul to give you the update on the um, nursing homes? Yeah, oh, good afternoon, Paul Mounds, Chief of Staff for the Governor. Just on the nursing home update, uh, first of all, I want to say uh, Commissioner Gifford, as well as uh, uh, director of DPH, Barbara Cass, have been in touch with all the nursing homes uh, thoroughly. Uh, currently at this time, we have uh, four that uh, did do uh, evacuations. That's Apple of Saybrook. They had a census of 63. Uh, Apple of Mystic, which had a census of 45. Apple of Guilford, which had a census of 69. And Apple of West Haven, which was a census of 71. Uh, as part of the plan, uh, all of those individuals were um, temporarily moved to other nursing facilities. And um, so that has been thoroughly coordinated. We are consistently watching that throughout the uh, emergency management protocol. And Thank you. you. Of course, um, Apple of Saybrook, Apple of Mystic, Apple of Guilford, and Apple of West Haven. And how many people at Guilford and West Haven? Guilford is 69, West Haven 71. Thank you so much. I think it's too early to say. Um, as you heard Marissa say, we go out, we start doing the damage assessment. As soon as the winds die down, you could do it safely. But we do have the emergency declaration. It's been accepted by the feds. So we'll be asking municipalities to quantify the extent of those damages and see what type of federal support we can get. Thanks, everybody.